Well, let's turn our Bibles to James chapter 1. James chapter 1, we'll pick back up again in verse 19. James chapter 1, verse 19 through 21 here in a moment. Last week we began to look at part 1 of a message entitled, Listen and Learn. And James has been encouraging us to be quick to hear and slow to speak and slow to become angry. And he's speaking in the context of when we hear the Word of God. In verse 18, he showed us that God uses His Word to save us. And then in verses 19 and following, he shows that God uses the same Word to sanctify us or to make us more like Him, to help us to grow as Christians. He talked to us about our attention, our acceptance, and our application of the Word of God. And then he'll really get into that in some detail uh, in the following verses, where he'll talk to us about looking in the Bible like it's looking in the mirror. And he says, don't just be a doer of the Word, but be a hearer. I mean, don't just be a hearer, but be a doer. And so it's not just that we would come and listen to the Word of God, or even read it in our quiet time, but that we would live it out in our daily lives. And so James is going to be talking to us about all these things. But let's pick up on part two of this subject. Listen and learn. <clears throat> James chapter 1, verse 19 to 21. Let's stand together all over the building. As we honor and reverence the reading of God's perfect word. James chapter 1, reading verses 19, 20, and 21. You follow along as I read because this now is God's inspired word. This you know, my beloved brethren. But everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted which is able to save your souls. Let's pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, we ask that the Holy Spirit would illuminate truths to us that we need to be aware of. Would help us to see your word in a fresh new light. Help us to have a greater appreciation of your word. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to apply these truths to our lives. We may become more like you. That is our deepest desire today. Speak now and we will obey. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. So for those who weren't here last week, the message is on, uh, on the, online. You can check that out. I've had them fill in the blanks what we covered last week. But very quickly, let me just say that we looked at the start of this. We looked at the attitude of a mature Christian. And James said there's a couple of requirements that you're going to have to meet if you want to be a mature Christian. One was that we had to be ready. And he told us there in verse 19, we must be quick to hear. You'll recall that when he says be quick to hear, he's talking about active listening. Too often times when we're listening, we're really not paying attention. We're just waiting for the other person to stop talking and take a breath so that we can jump in and say something that we want to respond to them. And James is saying that you must have active listening. You must prepare yourselves to obey what you're hearing. And again, he's not talking about just listening to a spouse or a parent or a co-worker or a friend. He's speaking in the context of when you hear the Word of God, whether it be in a sermon, whether it be in a Sunday school lesson, Wednesday night study, or in your own daily quiet time, however you're hearing the Word of God, you must be quick to hear what God is saying to you. And that is we must pay attention. We must actively listen and say, God, I expect to have you speak to me through your Word and I'm going to do the best that I can to apply it to my daily life. And then I gave you several meat and potatoes kind of things that you can do to become an active listener to God's Word, whether it be in your daily quiet time, or whether it be when you come in here to worship, and hopefully you applied those truths to your life, and that you had a stronger quiet time this past week uh, as a result of it. But then James said, you not only got to be ready, but you got to be restrained. And he said, let's restrain ourselves in two ways. Number one, by controlling our tongue. He says, be slow to speak. You can't listen when you're busy talking. And again, he's speaking in the context of God's Word. Don't be so quick to just want to pray all the time, but read your Bible. Praying, we're talking to God, but when we read the Bible, he's talking to us. 
We need to have much more emphasis focused on listening and reading God's word and less on talking. He already knows what's on our heart. He already knows what we're going to say. So we must spend more time reading and studying God's word uh, than we do even on prayer. And so he says, be, be slow to speak. Now, don't debate God's word. Don't argue with God when he shows you something in his word. Have a humble and teachable spirit so that you can learn something. And then we, we read the, uh, 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 David's prayer in Psalm 141, verse 3. He said, A guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. And we said if David was writing that today, he would also caution us in all the forms that we text out words, whether it be texting or whether it be social media, our Facebook, our Instagram, our Snapchat, and all the things that we're on out there today, we must guard what we put out there. When we put it out there, it's there for life. And I know you're saying some of those ones, they disappear in 10 seconds. They still have a little thing called screenshot. And they are screenshotting what you're sending out there, and it is there for life. Don't put anything out there you wouldn't want on the uh, evening news because it may just get out there. Y'all all right? We're living in a culture and a generation where they want to just put all their ignorance out there on social media. They go out and they, they rob places, they vandalize, they videotape it, and then they put it on social media. Just trying to help you all out. Then he said you've got to control your temper. He says, slow to anger. And again, he's not talking about becoming angry with a friend, a co-worker, your spouse. He's speaking in this context, becoming angry at the word of God. Becoming angry because some truth that is in the Word of God, you don't really like hearing what He has to say. And so we've got to guard against that mindset of saying, God, I don't like this verse, so therefore I'm going to just become angry with you and skip over it. That's why we see so many topical preachers nowadays, because they don't want to deal with the tough issues, so they go find verses that make them feel good and make their audience feel good, and they preach on those and they avoid the tough subjects. But when you go verse by verse through books of the Bible, eventually you're going to step on somebody's toes, and it might even be your own toes you step on. Well, that catches you up to speed to where we're at now. So let's move into part two. So James moves us from the requirements to the reason. Well, James, why should I do all these things you told me to do up there in verse 19? And the reason is found in verse 20. He says, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. When you're not quick to hear what God has to say, when you're too busy talking, and when you're becoming angry at God because of some truth in the Bible that you don't agree with, he says you'll never achieve God's righteousness in your life if you have that mindset. So that begs the question, is it always wrong to be angry? We know that Jesus got angry one time, and he did it while he was in church. He knocked over tables in the temple, he was sending money and animals flying everywhere. He was whipping people and chasing them out, uh, both those who were buying and those who were selling. Uh, and the reason why he did it was because they turned God's house into a den of thieves. He said, my father's house should be a house of prayer, but you turned it into a den of thieves. The problem was not that they were buying and selling animals because these people came to worship the Lord through one of their feasts and they had to buy the animals to make the sacrifices. The problem was they were selling the wrong kinds of animals and making a mockery out of the worship service. They were selling defiled animals and taking advantage of these poor travelers who didn't have the money to, to bring the animals with them, so they had to buy whatever was there, and the only thing they could buy was defiled animals, and that was the stuff they were having to give to God in the worship service, and Jesus says, that's not going to happen in my father's house. So Jesus was angry at the sin of the people. Paul put it this way in Romans chapter 1, verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And so God is a very loving and peaceful and gentle and patient God, but he's also a holy and just and righteous and angry God. And we must not get one side or the other. Otherwise, you go off too far to say he's always angry, and then you get into legalism, or you go to the other side and say he's always happy, and that's liberalism. You've got to make sure you have it right down the middle. Listen to what Psalm 97 verse 10 says. Hate evil, you who love the Lord. Hate evil, you who love the Lord. He says if you love God, you ought to hate sin, and you ought to despise it. 
There is an anger which is not sin. The key is this. If I am angry at nothing but sin, then I can be angry so as not to sin. So we don't get angry at other people. We get angry at sin in the lives of those around us and even at the sin in our own lives. It ought to make us angry that we violate God's holy law. Paul put it this way in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. He says, be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Now, a lot of folks think that James and Paul contradict each other in several areas in this letter. But that's not true. They're speaking to two different audiences about two different things and two different types of anger in this case. Paul is telling us that we are to be angry at sin. James is telling us that we are not to be angry at God's word. And so they're speaking about two different types of anger and at two different things. We are to be angry if we are angry at sin. And that's what Jesus was angry about, and that's what Paul was talking about. Pastor Johnny Hunt gives a good word here. He says, we get angry at the wrong things as Christians. We get upset with the deacon or the preacher, and we are furious with the music director. But we will tolerate any kind of ungodliness the world offers under the guise of not getting involved. Isn't that amazing? I mean, if they don't pick out the right songs, you say, I don't like the song selection they're getting around here. If we don't like a program, I don't like that program. I don't know why y'all were in that program that way. Well, preacher, I don't like the way that you're preaching. And we get angry at the wrong things, and yet we will tolerate all kinds of immorality out there and say, well, it's none of our business. You know, don't judge. Just mind your own business. That's why this country is in such a mess. It has nothing to do with the president, the Congress, and the government. It has to do with the church. Not letting their light shine in such a way that the others will say, hey, I want what you got. And being inspired to repent of their sins and come to know the Lord. We got everybody coming out of the closet, but the Christians are the ones hiding in the closet. Get out of that closet. Y'all all right? So he said in verse 20, For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Anger at God's word prevents us from hearing and applying it to our lives. The result is that we don't produce the kind of fruit that comes from a righteous life. And it's typically the result of pride in our life. Remember now, James is talking about being angry at God's Word. So when we hear God's Word, whether we're reading it in our daily quiet time or hearing it in a sermon or a Sunday school lesson, and we say, I don't like that truth. You, you stepped on my toes. And by the way, if I stepped on your toes, I'm sorry. I missed. I was aiming for your heart. <laughs> you see, folks that get their toes stepped on, they just get mad. Folks that get their hearts pierced, they get right with God. All right. I feel like jumping on his bike and riding a lap. <laughs> and so James is saying that don't be angry at the word of God. And usually when we get angry at a truth is because we have pride in our life. A new Star Wars movie just came out this weekend. You know, there's Darth Vader was the old bad guy. I think his son now is a new bad guy. But he was told over he was starting to turn to the dark side. We would call, talk about sin in your life. You're not living right. And then he kept getting angry and angry, and he wouldn't receive the rebuke because he had pride. And so he eventually went all the way over to the other side. And that's the way it is with people. You try to speak to them and impart truth into their life, but because of their anger and their pride, they say, who are you to judge me? Worry about yourself. And they won't receive the correction. And they become angry at the truth. And they turn towards a life of sin. And James is saying, don't get angry at me. If you've got problems, take them up with God because that's what God told me to tell you. So listen, if you don't like the message, go talk to God. I'm busy. And we get right with God. It's amazing what kind of things can happen in our life. Well, James moves us from the attitude of a mature Christian to the actions of a mature, mature Christian. 
So if I have the right attitude, I think right, then I'll behave right. If I think like God, I'll act like God. And that is the true desire of every born-again Christian, is that we will become more and more like Jesus and act just like Him. And that's what James has been driving home this whole chapter, is that God wants to use some things in your life to make you mature and complete, lacking in nothing. And one of those things is trials. And so these folks are dealing with trials. Sometimes they get angry about it. Sometimes they respond the right way, and they mature and they grow as Christians. And so he says in verse 21, therefore, and anytime you see that word therefore, you always ask the question, what is it therefore? It takes your attention back to what was just said because of what he already told us about being quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger because that anger will not achieve God's righteousness in your life. Based on all of that, here's what you need to do. You need to put aside all the filthiness in your life and all that remains of wickedness. That phrase, putting aside, it means to put away, to cast off, to lay aside. It's the illustration of taking off a coat. If you've got mud all over your coat, then you would take it off and you would cast it aside and say, I don't want to wear this coat, it's going to get me all dirty, so I'm going to cast it off and take it out to be washed. The writer of Hebrews puts it this way in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore... Since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, just spent an entire chapter talking about dozens of witnesses who ran the race with endurance, did well, God used them in a mighty way, and through all the trials they had to face in their life, they stayed faithful, and in the end, God blessed them. And he's saying to the Christians there that he's writing to that are suffering, he's saying, if you'll just act like those folks in chapter 11 then you also be able to run the race of endurance. He says, therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also, just like they did, let us lay aside, there it is, every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And so he's using the, the imagery of a runner in a race. Now you know back in the, in the biblical days they would wear a, a robe. And the ladies have on a long dress. Well, you've seen somebody run in a race. And you know they don't run in a dress. They don't run in a robe. Uh, they will wear a pair of shorts. Or if it's cold out, they might wear long pants. But they're going to do something that can make their legs free to run. And they're trying to make it as easy as possible. Now, they don't want to be restricted and restrained. And so the writer of Hebrews says there's two things in your life that are going to restrain you. They're going to keep you from running in a race effectively. It could be the, the weight or the encumbrances. Those things are not in and of themselves sin or sinful, but they can become sinful if you allow them to overshadow God's work in your life. And so he would talk about things like hobbies, uh, things like your family, things like work. All of those things, there's nothing wrong with them if they're in their proper place. Nothing wrong with going fishing and hunting and, and going to the beach and going to the lake and doing all these things as long as you do it in the proper place and proper time. Don't do it on Sunday. Y'all all right? And then he moves from that which may not necessarily be sin in and of itself to that which is sinful. He says not only the weight, but also you must lay aside the sin. Anything that is going to keep you from running that race with endurance. And you cannot run a race with God if you have sin in your life. You've got to get it cleaned up if you want to run. He says they so easily entangle us. It's the picture of a vine that has been trapped by, by, by these vines that are creeping up a tree and, and trapping that tree. In, in Alabama, they had kudzu. And they brought that in there to help with the irrigation problem. But then the kudzu took over and it wrapped around just about everything that it could. And it restricted the plants and the trees from growing. And he's saying that you would not try to run a race all tied up. You're not going to be able to run anywhere that way. You've got to free yourself and then you can run the race. He says, take the things that are in your life that are hindering you from running that spiritual race, lay them aside, get rid of them. And then run with endurance the race that is set before you. Now, now here's the funny thing. Is that the writer of Hebrews is talking about how the race is not a 30-yard dash. It's a marathon. But then Paul uses the language in Philippians of running a race. But he talks about sprinting. 
And so here's the imagery that we see. We are to run a marathon as though we're running a sprinting. Wow. And so sometimes we say, well, I'm just pacing myself. And he would say, pick up the pace and run a little bit faster. But not just for a little while in a short burst. Keep on running fast. Wow. Y'all all right this morning? No, it's hard to, to run a race. And it's hard to sprint during the entire race. And you can't do that when you've got stuff holding you down. You've got to get in shape. So he says there in verse 21 that we have to lay aside, cast it off, get rid of it, the filthiness. That's an interesting word. It comes from a compound word that means earwax. Earwax. And just as wax in your ears keeps you from hearing physically, spiritual earwax, sin in our lives, keeps us from hearing from God spiritually. Somebody put it this way, that this book will either keep you from sin or sin will keep you from this book. That's why a lot of folks don't want to get in the book. Because they know it's going to confront some areas of my life that are not pleasing to God. So therefore, I'll just avoid that. Or I'll avoid the verses that deal with the struggles that I'm facing in my life. And I'll find the verses on love and joy and peace. He says, not only the filthiness, but you've got to lay aside all that remains of wickedness. So what James does, he's using a lot of imagery here. And now he moves to the picture of a, a heart as a garden. And this heart is overgrown with weeds. The King James used the word superfluity. It speaks about an abundance. You know, a gardener has to prepare the soil. You don't go out there and just start sticking plants in the ground. You have to dig up the soil. And when you dig up the soil, you might find things under the soil that will hinder that plant from growing. There's roots under there, and there's rocks under there. John, you spent some time up north. And in New England, you will find, especially out in the country areas, there is a lot of rock walls around the perimeter of the houses. Well, where did all those rocks come from? It was when they cut down all the trees, and they dug up all the ground out there, and all those rocks came up, and so they said, let's put those rocks to good use, and let's make a wall instead of building a wooden fence. And so you'll notice a lot of rock walls in New England. I used to work for a landscaping company up there, and any time we dug, always it was a difficult task. Lots of rocks, lots of roots under there. It takes time to get all that stuff up, and it's hard work. And you've got to put in the effort of getting all that stuff up out of there and removing it and getting rid of it so when you plant the flowers, they have good soil to grow in. And there's not rocks and roots and other things in their way. And so James is saying that you've got to Clean up all this stuff to make room for the good seed, the Word of God. First John 1 John 1.9 says that we must confess our sins. And then God, because He's so faithful and righteous, He'll forgive us of that sin and He'll cleanse us from all the unrighteousness. We've got to remove the weeds so that we can properly receive the Word. Too often we plunge into Bible study or worship service without the proper preparation. We come here, we're running late, our minds are all over the place. We're already thinking before we even get here about what's going to happen when we leave. And we're not prepared to receive the Word of God. Every Sunday before service, me and the deacons get together and we pray for God to move in the service. Preparing our hearts, getting ready, God speak into our lives and help us. And when we come in here running around at the last minute, you are not spiritually ready. To receive God's word. Our attitude is speak now, Lord, or you'll lose your chance. Because I got a lot going on. Our minds are on something else, and then we wonder why we don't hear from God. We say, My quiet time is dead and boring. The Bible just doesn't come alive to me. I try to have time in prayer, but my mind's here and there and everywhere, and I just don't feel like I'm hearing from God. It's because our minds are not prepared, our hearts are not prepared. You've got to dig up all those rocks and all that root. Yeah, it's fun to plant the flowers and see them grow, but that's not going to happen unless we go through the hard work. Not only have we got to reject all wickedness, but he said we've got to receive God's Word. We must receive God's Word. That word receive means to welcome. 
I must accept God's word and make it mine. So when I come to the Bible, I don't just say, I wonder what James was saying to the folks back in his day 2,000 years ago. I say, what is God saying to me? What does this verse of Scripture have to do with my personal life? Otherwise, it's just somebody else's story. So we've got to make it mine. What is God trying to tell me when he makes the statement that I must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger? God, what do you want me to do about that truth? I must allow God's word to be at home in my heart and have access to every area of my life. There can be no area that I say, God, this area is shut off. God, you're in charge of my time, my Facebook, my family, my money, my career, my hobbies. God, you're in charge of all of it. Change anything in any way that you desire. Listen to what the psalmist said in Psalm 119, verse 11. I told you to go home and read all 176 verses. Every verse deals with the Word of God. If you want to hear a good series on it, Johnny Hunt did one. It took him 22 weeks. It's broken down to eight sections, 22 sections of eight verses. And he preached a great series on the whole psalm. But in verse 11, a very familiar verse, Your word I have treasured in my heart that I might not sin against you. He says, I have treasured it. It's welcome, not in my mind. It's not enough just to have Bible verses memorized. Some folks just got a good memory. We got pagan, atheist, uh, college professors who teach world religions. And this is just another book like any other book. And so they got a good mind and they've memorized verses. Remember in, in God's Not Dead, the professor who was an atheist, and he started quoting verses to the Christian boy after class. Yeah, they have them memorized, but they're not treasured in the heart. They're in the mind. It's not enough to just say, look how impressive I am. I can memorize these verses. Some folks got a bad memory. But they live out the Word of God more than somebody else who can quote the Word of God. As we said, it's in my heart. Why did I put it in my heart? Why do I love the Word? Why do I make it welcome in my home and in my heart and in my life? so that I may not sin against you. Because your word, God, tells me what you don't want me to do. And your, your word, God, tells me how not to do those things. And your word, God, tells me what I should do if I do those things. Our attitude is, I know what the Bible says, but... I know that the Bible says that I should support the work of the Lord, but I spent all my money out there on the worldly things and I got no money to put in the offering plate. I know that the Word of God says all folks who die without Christ are going to burn in hell, but I'm just shy and I don't like to witness. I know the Word of God says do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as is the habit of some. Don't skip church like some folks are, but I'm a busy person. I know your Word says pray without ceasing, but I'm just busy. We say I know your Word says this, but and God says, I am not interested in your butts. <laughs> You'll remember that one, won't you? That just came to me. So he says, in humility, receive this word. It's the idea of a teachable spirit. A proud know-it-all can't be taught anything. Do you know whether it's the word of God or dog training I'm constantly trying to learn from others. And I can learn even from a novice if I have a teachable spirit. There's great wisdom out there if you will just look and don't assume that you know more than the other person. Now, sometimes we do, but sometimes we don't. If you say, God, speak to me and use any resource you want to speak to me in. It's amazing what we can learn. Even a little child can teach us much about God if we just listen. Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 2, writing to a church that was plagued with sin. He says, if anyone supposes that he knows anything, you're, you're a know-it-all, nobody can teach you anything at all, he has not yet known as he ought to know. 
So sometimes we come to the Word of God and say, oh, he's preaching on that verse? I know this verse very well. He's not going to be able to teach me anything at all. Well, if you come in with that kind of attitude, that's probably what you're going to get out of it. You know, anytime I went somewhere and I said, God, I expect you're going to teach me. I got something out of it. But if I went there and said, oh, I was hoping somebody else was preaching at this conference today. Uh, he got sick and they brought this other guy in. I don't really know who he is anyway. Then I got nothing out of it. And so we got to come with the attitude of God speak to me through this word right here. This verse. You know there's times where I've had a verse where I've preached it several times, maybe different revivals and whatnot, and then I come back to it again another time, and I say, wow, when did you put that part in there? I didn't see that part before. Uh, I'm, I'm going to preach on John 3.16 next week. And, and, and if I don't talk as slow as Jerry has encouraged me to talk, I might get through that one verse. A familiar verse, you've heard it a thousand times, you can probably quote it from heart, and we're going to look at some biblical truths out of God's greatest gift that he gives to us. And we'll compare that to other gifts. Well, he says that we have to receive the word and plant it. James continues his picture with the heart being soil and God's word being seed. You say, I wonder where he got that idea from. Probably from his half-brother. Remember now, he was his half-brother because Jesus was born of a virgin. That was a good place right there to shout amen. <laughs> I, I gave you a chance to do that when we first started this series, and you missed it then, you missed it again. Remember, if he was not born of a virgin, you and I ha have uh, no hope at all getting the other side. Because that means he had sin in his life, he couldn't be a sacrifice. Well, let's go to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13, and we'll look at this real quick and then close it out. So Jesus uses the illustration of the heart being the soil and the word being the seed. And he talks about four different kinds of hearts. He talks about a, a hard heart, a shallow heart, a crowded heart, and then he talks about a fruitful heart. And only the last one was a true Christian. The others were all false Christians. So in, in chapter thir uh, uh, 13, look what he says. We'll look down around verse 3. It says, he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate them up. Others fell on the rocky places where they did not have much soil. And immediately they sprang up because there was no depth of soil. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out. And others fell on the good seed soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. And again, he's using the same understanding of hearing as James is. Not talking about hearing physically, not the wrong day physical ears, talking about hearing spiritually. And then some of the folks were confused. <clears throat> and then they said, good night, what are you talking about? What he did was he used illustrations they could understand. So he was probably standing out by a farm somewhere and said, let me use this as an illustration what I want to talk and he'd teach biblical truths to them. If he was talking to folks today, he would use different illustrations. He would use technology in a lot of his illustrations. But then, in case anybody's confused, he explained exactly what he meant by that in verse 18. He says, here then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom, that's the, the seed, is the word of God, the Bible, the gospel. He says, and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches it away, what has been sown in his heart. This is the one on whom the seed was sown beside the road. Now, you wouldn't just take some seed and throw it out there in the parking lot. It wouldn't grow anything. It might find some dirt and cracks in the pavement, but it's not really going to produce much of a crop. And so it says, that individual says, the Bible's confusing to me. I don't get it. I don't understand it. They don't seek spiritual wisdom from God that James talked about in chapter 1. And so because of that, Satan comes along and says, that guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Don't worry about that. And takes it away. Then he says in verse 20, the one on whom the seed was sown 
on the rocky places. This is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Wow, preacher, that's a good word. I like that. I never saw that before. Verse 21, yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. So here's somebody who says, I get to go to heaven when I die? Sure, sign me up. But then when they find out that the health and wealth and prosperity that's being promoted on TV is not reality, they say, oh, I didn't want to sign up for persecution and difficulty and trials. No, I thought if I become a Christian, then I get a better job with more money. Uh, my family life would be perfect. My health would be great. I get that nice new car, that new home, get to go on vacation. Oh, you mean I got to suffer? No, I don't want to know that. And so they leave the church. And John said they went out from us because they were not of us. Had they been of us, they would have not gone out from us. So when you find somebody walks down an aisle and three months later you can't find them, probably wasn't real. Then he said in verse 22, there's another guy. And the one on whom the seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. So this is the person, I want to follow Christ, but again, it's not the health and wealth and prosperity he was hoping for. And then he gets distracted and thinks, okay, the things of the world are much more pleasing to me than the things of God, so therefore I'm going to turn my back on God, I'm going to go out here and engage in the things of the world. That individual didn't get saved. Then he comes to the last heart in verse 23. And the one on whom seed was sown on the good soil. This is the man who hears the word and understands that he has spiritual insight from the Holy Spirit and who bears, indeed bears fruit and brings forth some a hundred, some sixty, and some thirty. So different levels of fruit depending on his maturity level and how close he is to God, but all of them bear fruit. And that is the evidence of a true born-again Christian. There ought to be fruit in your life. And Jesus talked about that in great detail in John chapter 15. So there was nothing wrong with the soil and the seed. The problem was the soil. One was on rocky ground. One was among thorns. And because of all these things were happening in their life, they didn't produce any kind of fruit. But when the soil was prepared and ready to receive the, the, the seed, which is the word, that soil produced much fruit. And when we come to church and our minds are cluttered and wandering all over the place, or we come to our daily quiet time and our mind is all over the place, we're saying, God, you've got to be quick now because I'm late for work. Or, well, God, I've been so busy wrapped up in doing all this stuff all day long, but now I'm tired, I'm fixing to go to bed in about five minutes, so speak quickly before you lose your chance. And we say, God, why don't I seem to have any purpose or direction in my life at all? Why am I so confused? Why is my life so miserable? And God will say, because you don't spend time with me. I'm trying to help you out, but you're just too busy. You can sit down and watch a movie or a football game for three hours, but you can't spend a little bit of time in the Word. You can go on Facebook every five minutes and see how many people liked your post, and how many people commented on it, and all this stuff, but you can't spend five minutes in the Word. And it says you're just too busy with the wrong thing. And because you've not prepared the soil, therefore you're not going to get much fruit out of your life. So back in James, he says that this word is able to save your souls. God's word is able to help us overcome sin, but we must allow it. There is nothing wrong with the seed. The problem is the soil. It says, save your souls. Now, James is not talking to, about saving our souls in a sense of salvation from sin's penalty. He's talking to Christians, believers. He's mentioned that three times already. He calls them beloved brethren. He said it in verse 18, he said it in verse 16, he said it in verse 2. So he's speaking to Christians. What he's talking about is salvation from sin's power, what we would call sanctification. That growing process of becoming more like God. And he's saying, as you allow the Word of God to work in your heart, the same Word that saved you 
and led you to Christ and helped you become a Christian is the same word that's going to help you become a, a, an obedient Christian, an effective Christian. Wow, so much more to say. Time is always... You, you know, I'm, I'm watching... Do y'all like Bob Ross? You ever watch Bob Ross paintings? That, that guy is so talented. I mean, he, it looked like he's just throwing paint on a, on a screen. And, and then you say, well, what is this guy doing? He made a mess of that screen. And then five minutes later, boom, he's got a nice tree right there. And he said, this happy little tree. <laughs> in a happy little mountain. And, and, he talk, and he's always saying, and I, and I see him looking all the time. He's looking. Over what are you looking at, Bob? He's, he's looking at the clock. He's only got 30 minutes on the show. And, and so he's looking at the clock. And he said, well, and the little clock on the wall tells me it's time to go. Like the preacher. Always time to go. Never have enough time. Listen and learn. God's word is absolutely perfect. It is able to do great things in your life and through your life if you will receive it and not debate it, not argue with God about it, not try to find loopholes of why you don't have to obey this particular verse, but say, God, I want to live out your word in my daily life. How's your daily quiet time? I'm convinced that those who have a strong daily quiet time have a deep desire to be in God's house every time the doors are open. They come with expectation. They come with anticipation. They come with urgency. And they say, God, I expect you're going to speak to me and my life is going to be changed as a result of my time with you. But those who come in here and just run into the motions because they feel like, well, I've got to be somewhere on Sunday and I don't want them to call me up and ask me where I've been for six months. So I'll just show up and go through the motions. You'll get very, very little out of it. Very little. And you know, it's the same in every church. First Orlando will have several thousand there today. Probably a few hundred on Wednesday night. Where does everybody go? I mean, they got great praise teams and full orchestra and choir and band and everything. Much better preaching than what y'all getting here. That, that wasn't the right place to say amen now. <laughs> and yet they still, the numbers were doing on Wednesday night. Sunday school, same thing. Why? Strong daily quiet time. And, and I don't meet me out in the park a lot and tell me that you're, you're sick or you've got to work or something. I know some folks can't be here. I'm telling you, a majority of folks could be here. If it's important to you, you'll find a way. If not, you'll find an excuse. And so how is your daily quiet time? How is your attitude toward the Word of God? James is going to say, I'm going to know what your attitude is like because I'm going to find out whether you're living it out in your daily life or not. If you're a doer of the Word, it's because you love the Word like the psalmist did in Psalm 119. If you're not a doer of the Word, you're just a hearer only, then I'm going to know that the Word is not really that important to you. You know that we're having an important meeting here today. And I would encourage you to come to this altar and say, God, not my will be done, but your will be done. And say, God, what do you want to happen? Because ultimately, we're all here to serve God. We're bond servants of the Most High God. We have no say in the matter whatsoever. We're simply here to say, God, what is your will? And help us to carry it out at all costs. So let's all stand for prayer. The altar is going to be wide open. I would encourage you once again to grab your Bible, come to the altar, and say, God, give me a deep, hunger for your word i desperately desperately want to carry out your word in my life let's pray together father in jesus name we are so grateful for our bibles we recognize that many of our brothers and sisters around the world would love to have a completed bible in their hands and for various reasons they can't get them and lord we have so many copies and yet we don't read the Bible. We don't study it. Forgive us, O oh God. Help us to be like the psalmist who said that your word was so precious to him that he treasured it in his heart and his deepest desire was that he would not sin against you. Lord, help us have the same mindset. And Lord, help us to do all the things that are necessary in our life to make time to read and to study and to share your word. Father, I don't know the spiritual needs of anybody in this room, but you do. Would you meet each person at the point of their greatest need? When you make it clear to them that you are the one that is meeting that need, 
that we may praise you and only you. We love you, Lord. We thank you that you loved us first and that you always love us the most. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God has spoken. This altar is wide open. You come right now.